All right, I have 11 o'clock. Um, Madam Clerk, I'm gonna go ahead and call it into order. We do not take roll. This is not an official, there's no votes. There's nothing going on here. This is, lack of a better term, more of a work session. Uh, we talked about, you know, we talked at the beginning of this quadrennium about what we were gonna focus on and how we had a heavy lift and what ethics was going to be. Um, I, I wanted you guys to get through the first session because everything's nuts at the first session. But then as we started, I told you, let's get summer. And then once summer is done, it's time to get to work and see what we can do. Um, the, the basis of where we're starting here, I, I, don't, I don't believe in reinventing the wheel. So the basis and where we're starting is going to be this commission report that was created in March 2019 by the Code of Ethics Clarification and Reform Commission. Um, this is a, an extensive commission that met for many hours. There's a ex distinguished group of members who were serving on this board, serving in this commission, and they put a lot of work into this effort. So I feel like we owe it to that commission report to kind of understand what they what they found, some of the highlights, some of the highs, some of the lows, some of you know where we are. This was about a 74 page, 76 page report that they came out with. Um, I've read it, I've gone through it, but it's, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot to digest. It's a lot to digest from what we're going to get into. So for the purpose of today's meeting, I wanted to have, we have Jimmy Intrican from LSA. Jimmy's going to kind of walk us through what this commission report said. So that we all kind of have a, a background of where are we, what the, what are the issues? What are we going through here? We have twofold in this meeting and I've talked to Jimmy about it already. We have legislators that will actually be voting on this that we're trying to educate the legislators to talk about what we threw. And we have the general public as well. A lot of general public in the audience today, a lot of people directly affected by the ethics code, including the ethics commissioner. Um, and chief, I see you over there. There's my Baldwin County chief over there. Um, we have a lot of people here that are involved just because this is an important issue. And I feel the timing may be right for us to pick up this mantle and see what we can do to address it. Um, if you've looked through the report, the, and I don't want to step on Jimmy, so I'm going to let him go through that. But one of the things that I want the public to be aware, under the ethics statutes as they are right now in Alabama, 300,000 individuals are directly affected by the ethics laws as we go through. By the time you count their family members as well, that's well into over a million people are directly affected by the ethics laws of what we deal with in Alabama. So I wanted us to educate the general public as well. Let them see what the problems are. Let them see what the issues are. Let's put let's put transparency in this. Let's air it all out so that oh, we can all have discussions so we can come by. And when we come through, if we have some legislation that we can get out that we say, no, we started working on this in August, you know, where we, we let everybody be involved in every meeting along the way. So Jimmy's not only going to educate us to us today, he's also going to educate the general public as well for the problems and the issues that we see in ethics. If at any time today, you or people that have joined us online, we have Representative England, Representative Lomax. Do we have anybody else online? Okay, we have some more that were had indicated they were going to get online on the Teams program. If y'all have questions, if you want him to be, go deeper into a unknown point, participant is now joining. If you want him to go into a point, the whole purpose of this is to learn and to be educated on what we had to do and where we are. So with that, Mr. Intrigan, I'm going to turn it over to you to kind of give us the best you can on this 74 page, 76 page report. I will try my best. Unknown participant is now exiting. R wrong, wrong teams meeting. Um, yeah. So obviously I, I echo the sentiments of the chairman. Like there's a lot in here. I, and I had the pleasure of having a front row seat to this commission when it was meeting. I, Tom, I can't believe it's been four years ago that this report, since this report has come out and uh, almost five since the, that commission met, they met, you know, basically monthly over the course of about a year, if I'm, my memory's right. Um, and as I was reading back through this, of course, the challenge at first, I thought, oh, yeah, we'll just take the report and throw it into a PowerPoint, maybe make it easier to, to digest. And I kept getting lost in my own thoughts, right, in my own world as I'm going through this, like, oh, yeah, that was what they just talked about. And, oh, yeah, there's this issue. So uh, like the chairman said, my, my, my desire here and my hope here is just to kind of give a, a overview of the topics. This is a, a pretty thick report. 
not everything in this report is in this PowerPoint that I'm about to go over. This is just to kind of give some, some of my, this is, this is Jimmy Intrican's highlights, right? My takeaways, there's more in the report than what I'm gonna kind of cover, more issues, and I may miss some things, um, but my mind is put to ease a little bit knowing that everybody has a copy of this commission report and it's public and can go out there and kind of verify what I'm saying. And um, there's even folks in the audience, like Mr. Chairman mentioned, that might be able to help clarify, answer some questions, add to it. And I'm happy to happy to entertain any of that kind of thing as well. So, but before I jump into um, the actual PowerPoint, I, I was going to mention this quote that comes to mind whenever I, oftentimes when I deal with ethics, one of my favorite quotes of all time is about humility. And it says, humility is the one thing that if you think you've got it, you've lost it. And that's how I feel a lot of times when it comes to ethics, right? A lot of times we think, okay, you know, I think it can apply. We got, here's this ethics. We kind of got our minds wrapped around, you know, the most important things, at least that we think. And then lo and behold, some other circumstance comes along. Times change, economies change, you know, uh, workforces change, different interactions, ways people relate change. And so I think it's a good exercise that y'all are doing, Mr. Chair, to kind of at least routinely kind of take a look at where we are and to take advantage of this commission's work that they put into it. So. With that being said, let's kind of go ahead and get started um, here. So we'll try to go to the next slide. So we jump in. First, I wanted to kind of mention a couple of quick things um, about, let's, yeah, let's go to slide two. Yes. And that little, yeah, hit that thing. And then um, there'll be an arrow down below to the left. Okay. Um, so let's go to that. Yeah, let's go to that next slide. All right. So real quick, the, you know, you guys know this, but just for the sake of kind of hitting some of these high points, right? That the, there was 2010 revisions were the major revisions to the ethics laws. Since then, 19 ethics or ethics related, you know, amendments, tweaks have happened to that, um, to those major revisions in 2010. And uh, so that, you know, that, that, that's a good chunk. Um, before the ethics laws were here, there was mainly out of constitutional law that was driven, no bribery, con no conflicts of interest, that kind of thing. In 1973, the act was criminally put into the code, and then in 2010, major revisions happened, and like I said, 19, 19 tweaks since that time. All right, let's go to the next slide. So this is just a quick little slide about the commission's work, right? Uh, and I'm, by the way, I apologize in advance. This is a lot of reading, but it is less than 75 pages worth of reading. Okay, so but it, so it's still kind of helpful, I think, to read over this and uh, uh, and get everybody kind of on the same page and tracking the same way. So, so the, the the task of the commission, right, was to be an advisory commission charged with studying and making recommendations to reform and clarify the code of ethics. And it was, uh, you know, supposed to give its report, which it did, um, to the legislature on the first day of the 2019 regular session, and then it dissolved. So that's what that's what it did. Uh, it was co-chaired by um, uh, the ethics director, Tom Albritton, and by Steve Marshall, the AG. There were three senators and three House members that were a part of this, and, and a bunch of various designees from stakeholders from all over, from the governor to the state bar to county commissions to the association uh, of uh, – uh, executives, the the associate, yeah, and the press association, twenty three people at all. So it, it was a ve very much so a wide assortment of folks from state, like I said, stakeholders from uh, around around the state that had interest, that had knowledge, that had expertise, and I think everybody brought a lot to the table. So. Um, Okay, let's move on to the next slide. And sorry, y'all, we don't have a clicker, so we're having to, Vaughn is do, uh, doing excellent work over there trying to work with me and uh, and, and click through this. Um, so, okay, there was five main areas of focus, right? And, and yet, yet, yet again, this is this is in the report. You can kind of go through these sections. Um, these, uh, these five areas were things of value, uh, which were colloquially referred to as gift ban. So you'll see the word gift ban. If you hear the word gift ban, uh, at least when the, in the commission report, if you take a deeper dive into it, that's kind of what it's talking about is these, uh, the thing of value restrictions, meaning, okay, what can be given, what can be solicited, what can be received, what can be exchanged between, um, as we'll see, public servants, which is elected officials, appointed officials, and uh, staff, right, employees. Um, and uh, principals and lobbyists. So the next section is the, uh, we cover the definition of scope of principle. That took up a lot of time amongst the committee. We'll get into that. Number three, the definition and scope of conflicts of interest, which permeates the entirety of the ethics laws and the purpose of the ethics laws, as we'll get into later. Um, revolving door, uh, which is referring to both 
legislators, public officials at all, all levels of government, although it kind of originated with more of the legislative arenas to, from leaving their public service and entering into private service. Um, and that's a, that was a topic that was addressed there. And then lastly, we're gonna uh, touch on, if we have time, some disclosure requirements for statements of economic interests. Which the, so those are the five main areas of focus from the, um, from the commission. All right, let's, click. first thing we're talking about is uh, the, okay. yeah, ma'am. Absolutely. <laughs> While she's doing that, I'll mention this, that throughout this report, at the end of each section, there was statutory recommendations that were made, proposed like, hey, here's something you can do in statute. Uh, many times there were alternatives given without one specific said this was the unanimous consent of the committee. Instead, a lot of it was, hey, here's several ideas that we discussed and came up with for your consideration. You'll, now, I did not include that part in this PowerPoint. That's a, so a lot of the, no, I did, I did some, but a lot of the statutory drafting is in the report that you can take a look at and see, especially if there's a particular topic of interest that you want to take a deep dive into at some point, you know, after this meeting, before the next meeting. Um, but that would just have been, there's already going to be a lot of reading in this presentation, and so I didn't want to add that to it, plus that just creates all kinds of questions, and you have to kind of um, think through, well, what did it previously say? What does this say? What, what are the changes? You know, that kind of thing. So for the sake of time, it's that is in the report, but there's not a whole lot of the, it's my takeaways from what those changes were, not necessarily the express statutory language, which you can look at that at a different time. All right, so what do we mean when we talk about these th thing of value restrictions and the gift bans? So lobbyists and principals are prohibited, and the statute section is uh, 3625.5.1. Uh, that's the, by the way, that's the uh, the title and the chapter 3625. If you hear me say 5.1 or 7 or section 1, you know, I'm I'm referring to 3625 and then uh, and then the particular code sections because that's where our ethics laws are organized uh, under. Title 36, Chapter 25. So anyway, lobbyists and principals are prohibited under 3625 5.1 from offering or providing a, quote, thing of value to public officials or public employees or their family members. And uh, the inverse of that applies to public officials and employees and their families cannot solicit or receive things of value. Um, so talking a little bit more about things of value, Right, so this broadly includes any gift, benefit, favor, or other item of monetary value, and that comes from section uh, the definition section 134. So um, I didn't underline any, but I probably should have because it's, so it's a very broad, inclusive topic here. Um, but it has 18 exclusions, and some of those exclusions have exclusions within those exclusions, right? And they have, or they have uh, active circumstantial terms that, that attach possibly or, you know, possibly not to those exclusions. So that's what we have with our, you know, that's what the kind of the, the commission approached um, this is under the, they understood, okay, this is a broad term with a lot of exclusions. All right, let's go to the next slide. So some examples of those uh, exceptions or exclusions are uh, campaign, inauguration contributions, gifts from family or friends, uh, and here's that term, right? Under circumstances which make it clear that the gift is not motivated by official position. So, um, so there's a little bit of the terminology thrown into the definition, right? The actual terminology. You've got items of de minimis value, and de minimis is um, actually defined elsewhere, uh, and it actually can be modified by CPI adjustments. I believe that this commission has modified it uh, recently because of uh, the inflation rate. Um, anything for which the recipient pays full value. Um, loans on terms generally available to the public. Employment compensation earned in the ordinary course of business, as long as the circumstances show it's unrelated to public service. Food and beverages for educational functions, widely attended events, economic development functions. Um, and then outside of those specific events where, uh, where you know, the educational events and um, widely attended events is a separate exclusion for uh, food, beverage, meals, that kind of thing from a principal or a lobbyist. Uh, there are $25 per meal for a lobbyist with a $150 annual cap and then $50 uh, for principals with a $250 annual cap. So those are some examples of the exceptions that are included. Um, 
let's go to the next slide if we can, which I think should be the notable exception. So here's some things out from the report that the commission identified as, uh, so okay, here's some things we kind of want to take a look at. Number, was, number one was the broad definition with the numerous exceptions. And they're all contained with the, de when the definition section instead of necessarily being put in the active provisions of the act. And you know, if you talk to legislative professionals, uh, drafters, that kind of thing, um, in fact, we had somebody come and speak to us, uh, a, a, a federal uh, judge. Uh, one of the point and the takeaways from uh, to our LSA lawyers was, hey, when you're drafting, it's for somebody that may not be familiar with it, looking at it for the first time, might be easier to um, put some, like make the definitions as simple as possible and put what you actually want to prohibit or not prohibit in the actual embodiment of the, the, the active, the operational provisions of the, of the statutes and the codes. I mean, and you'll see that was, ends up being one of the recommendations that we'll get to on the next slide. But so you have that, then you have the use of the language it was sometimes vague or amb ambiguous under certain circumstances. And that's, I want to reiterate that phrase right there under certain circumstances, right? Sometimes, well, actually I would say a lot of times, the commission would consider, and maybe you all consider this as well, like, okay, a, a phrase in the ethics code makes sense, maybe, you know, a, in a lot of ways, maybe even 90% of the time, then you come across one circumstance where it's like, oh, wait a minute, well, under that circumstance, the this this phrase or this language doesn't necessarily, you know, specify exactly what should be done. So that's what we mean by, you know, vague or ambiguous under certain circumstances. This other next point I have here is what do other states do? Um, there was some research dug into in our office uh, that was presented to the commission that just kind of talked about, okay, where are other states on these gift ban laws? What do other states do? Um, and a little bit more is put into the commission report in case you want to dive into that, you can. But uh, in summary, so a few states have zero tolerance policies. You know, that's no cup of coffee was the phrase that we use. Like, yeah, you just can't provide anything, period. No cup of coffee, no nothing. On the other end of that sp spectrum were a few states that have restrictions um, that basically are f not any, hardly any restrictions, right? as long as there's full disclosure and no quid pro quo. So just a couple of big kind of foundational rocks in there, right? But other than that, it's like, okay, it's all fine as long as these two things are, as long as there's no corruption and as long as there's full disclosure of everything. And then there's, uh, most states kind of fell in the middle and that's where Alabama fell, was somewhere in the middle of those two kind of bookends. Um, another kind of takeaway was uh, that was discussed by the commission was there was no distinction between penalties for actual corruption um, or uh, versus areas of only potential corruption or maybe even perceived corruption, right? So, and this was in particularly discussed in this particular area because you're talking about a meal possibly, right? A meal, well, what if that meal goes over by $1? What if it goes over by $5? What if it goes about $10? And what if it's just one time? You know, uh, what if it's, but what if it's repetitive, right? What if it happens over and over again by somebody that keeps violating that provision? But at the very least, there's no distinction right now, right? You, you, you violate that section and your options are class B felony or class A misdemeanor, right? As opposed to some of the more serious, what, you know, I think what a lot of people would agree, some of the more serious provisions of the Ethics Act where there's actual corruption taking place, like Section 7, right? You can't do anything for a corrupt purpose, right? Um, or using office of personal gain under section five, like, okay, somebody clearly used their office, misused their office for their own personal benefit, as opposed to going over, a, you know, a, a meal limit by a few dollars, but there's no distinction in there. And that was, that was talked about by the commission in good, uh, in a good bit. So, um, uh, you know, the commissioners and the chairs kind of realize that maybe this is a kind of a takeaway from the report that maybe there'd been a little bit because of that harsh, uh, lack of distinction that sometimes it could be watered down to help prevent, you know, catching too many fish, too many small fish in a net that wasn't intended to. Um, so uh, as we'll see, the committee looked at um, uh, trying to trying to address that. Okay, so let's go to the next page. So on this slide, we have some of the proposed statutory changes that was identified in the report, right? So and I'm just going to kind of go over these again. Sorry for the reading, but so replace the current definition and its 18 exclusions and um, and the operative statutory provision, which is 5.1, with more of a kind of streamlined, consolidated, and uh, maybe standalone may not be the best word for it, but a streamlined and consolidated version, right, of the gift ban statute with fewer exceptions, right? Let's let's get let's let's kind of streamline this, get to the heart of 
what should be banned, what shouldn't be banned, and have less exclusions, more clarity, less exclusions. Um, they uh, they recommended prohibiting public employees and uh, officials from soliciting anything uh, but a campaign contribution from a lobbyist, including subordinates of a lobbyist, or a natural person who is a principal. That wasn't a distinction that was made before. You know, sometimes a principal, you know, as we'll kind of get into, could be a, a business, it could be an individual. Okay, well, if the, if the principal is an individual, then they wanted, they thought it might be good to add that to the list of what is prohibited. And the idea here was to make it just a little bit more clear, hey, we're banning everything, right? We're banning anything but clarify between who a little bit more clearly and then provide fewer exceptions um, and uh, make those exceptions more clear. So the uh, another recommendation was to eliminate the lobbyist and principal meal cap distinctions. Um, you know, the, I, I mentioned earlier, 25, 150 for lobbyists, 50, 250 per year for principals. Uh, one of the recommendations was just get rid of that if it's, and keep the same meal cap no matter uh, whether it's a lobbyist or a principal. Uh, next point was uh, establish additional guidelines and distinctions for business relationships that were established prior to the public service versus after beginning the public service, right? And that's that's kind of that's something that I tend to come across from time to time in my position as general counsel with LSA was like, okay, well, should we have the same standard, right? It's it, it's a little bit easier to address in my opinion, if it's before, right? When you're talking about establishing circumstances that make it clear that what's happening is not because of your official position then uh, it's a little bit clear if it was before. But what about afterwards? Should we have different standards for if, uh, or a way to, a way to analyze um, things for after you become, after you, uh, friendships that get established, for instance, after relations that get established after you enter public service um, and the gifts that are exchanged in relation there too. So uh, next you have uh, the recommendation to establish specific and graduated penalties for gift ban violations. Um, keeping the class B felony punishment for intentional violation, maybe having a graduated punishment scale, right? Uh, violation scale from there on down to um, incidental isolated cases. As you can see, that's that, that's kind of listed more in some of the recommended language in the actual report. Um, a lot of conversation was given as to um, what constitutes an intentional violation right now. The uh, And that's kind of its own separate topic, which may you know, is that kind of permeates throughout all of the ethics laws, but um, it was particularly addressed in this particular section uh, a pretty good bit. So what, what does that mean to constitute a, an intentional violation? Right now, intentional violations, I believe under the Ethics Act are the class B, and then there's various forms of class A misdemeanors, but the, the question is, okay, well, if it's intentional, what does that mean? If it's not intentional, what does that mean? We, you know, and, and how do we get into that? So, um, in fact, I will mention this. In the language that's in the report, there were, uh, I would say, pretty con pretty good consensus on, hey, we think this is a good idea for how to revise the gift ban statute. Streamline it, modernize it, make it a little bit more, you know, clear. Uh, there were, however, one portion of that was this section right here, what constitutes an intentional violation. And there were six different alternative length statutory proposals given for that one particular area, right? Six different versions because there's just a lot of nuance involved. And there's a lot of, you know, there was criminal lawyers there. There were, there were civil lawyers there. There were just regular practitioners and stakeholders that all kind of had different ideas and different way, you know, viewpoints, lenses. They were uh, viewing things to help make things understandable to them. So there were six different versions which are all contained in the report, but each of those versions contained a combination of one of three elements, okay? And this is not this is not on the slide, sorry. It's just, uh, it'll be a lot to read, but I got it written right here. So all six versions contained one or more of these elements. Element one, did the person issue, you know, knew or should have known that he or she was covered by the gift ban laws? Um, you know, such as a lobbyist or a subordinate of a lobbyist, a principal, that kind of thing, a public official. Like, in other words, should should the person have known that they were covered by the laws? Element two uh, was whether the person knew or should have known that the gift or the benefit that he or she was providing to someone else or received from someone else was prohibited. And then number three, that uh, the person knew or should have known that the person he or she provided the gift or benefit to was an individual covered by the gift ban law. So there's basically three different perspectives, the giver, the gift, and the recipient, right? 
how many, like whether there's intentional elements or knowing or should have known, those are the three different perspectives that were looked at. So out of all the different versions, those are the three elements that were one or more of those elements was present in each one of those. And which ones do you focus on? Well, there's, there's more in the report on that. Okay, let's, uh, well, I guess I'll say the last point. Um, the last recommendation was to, was to eliminate the application of the gift ban between lobbyists, principals, and public service who do not have interest before the same governmental body. That's a pretty interesting point, a pretty forward thinking recommendation, I think. And that was, um, okay, well, is this gift ban, like, was it, is it really, like, is it serving its purpose by having a broad gift ban, or is it really trying to protect the potential conflicts of interest, potential using of office of personal gain, potential corruption? And if so, would it be, uh, you know, helpful to recommend saying, okay, well, if we're, if we're not trying to go beyond what the, un, you know, the underlying fundamental purpose is, maybe we could separate this out to say, okay, if you were in the state legislature, your state, statewide officials are one category, but if you're a local official at a, you know, local, at a county or municipal level, and that's where your sphere of, uh, of your jurisdiction is, your sphere of influence, your authority, and you're dealing with somebody in a, in a municipality across the, you know, the, across the state, there's there's much less there was much less of a concern by the commission on that kind of situation. So one of the recommendations was to kind of bifurcate that um, that process and have it not apply uh, except for the folks that are in that same jurisdiction. Because that applies not only to elected officials, but that also applies to public servants as well. Right. right? So you're that's talking right. the anybody that's involved in the city government or say they don't make decisions as far as hiring, firing, or budgeting for anything from a lobbyist, but and my understanding as well, and tell me if I'm wrong, it's not only just those public servants, but it also extends to their family and extended family as well. That's right. And that's how we get to the seven figures as far as people that are in, encompassed in this law is because it's not just the public servant who just works for government that has no decision-making authority, but also their families. And so there's so many people that fall under these ethics laws right now that it's just, it's overwhelming. I, I think that's a fair point. Uh, does the does or should, which is, you know, up, up to this body, right? Does or should the public employee at a, at a local city, right? Uh, some municipality in North Alabama need to bear in mind the gift ban restrictions for uh, a lobbyist who is a lobbyist down in South Alabama, right? In, in Mobile County, right? Is that, is that really going to impact uh, a potential? Is, is there really a perceived or an actual potential of corruption there? So yeah, that, that, is it meant to do that, or is it meant to mainly cover? Okay, I'm a I'm a statewide legislator, and uh, so I got to be watching out for everybody. But oh, I'm you know I'm a municipal operator, therefore this person over here on the other side of the state has, has nothing to do with. Can't, I can't do anything necessarily to gain or influence them so in a negative way, uh, with with regards to their official position, um, and. I'm trying my best not to look at uh, the director of the Ethics Commission to see if he's nodding in agreement or disagreement, because there was a lot of thought that goes into this, right? And he has an incredible, uh, incredibly great perspective on this with all of his experience. Uh, and there was, like I said, a lot of conversation, and it was four years ago. So if I may, I, I think that I'm relaying that right and that sentiment right, but if not, there's plenty of time to dig into it further, right? And to, to kind of get into it more and hear from the folks that were there, right? The stakeholders, Director Albritton, uh, Steve Marshall, and, and, and others. So now maybe we can switch into... Um, talking about principles, unless there are any other questions, right, on the thing of value, which is, which is fun, or I'll just keep going, hitting the high points. Any questions for you? Like, if, if at any point you have anything that you want to st get him to stop and ask, he's well aware to, to answer questions. This is a working session as far as there's no bad questions. Uh, any information that you have, I guarantee, any question that you have, I would be willing to bet you that there is a constituent of yours or somebody that is this law affects that has that same question you're thinking that just don't realize, hey, I wish somebody would ask that question. I, I, you know, to clarify, like, you can dive a little deeper into this if you need to discuss your department heads you do you have a lot of influence in the community maybe not your private cut in the grass or I, you know i can see those things but i do think that there's still some might need to be kind of kept in place too but i, I assume those things will be discussed later we'll yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. 
And Mr. Chair, I would, I would add just, so those of us that have been in local government, I mean, you know that in this role, you immediately realize how much scope you have. I mean, you can touch anything with a law or, or things you can do, but local government is very much, I mean, we've defined it as a legislature, what they can do and what they can. And so the scope is so much smaller that it seems like a rule like that at the end that um, whatever that looks like, it would, would be smart because I mean, there is a lot less that a, the city government can do. If you're on a planning zoning commission, I mean, there's certain things and, and people that have business before planning and zoning, uh, you know, uh, councils or anything, that there's a scope that they have. And so opening that up to everything just seems a little bit, um, It's a, that's an interesting point that's at the end there, just because it, it is such a different role. You know? and, and it's not just government employees. You look at, I mean, it's not just government officials for that purpose. That you're, your teachers, your education system, there's so many people that fall under this category that it's just, it's 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 a lot. Well, for example, a building inspector. I mean, they have a tremendous power over a local business or whatever, but their scope is very small. They have tremendous power over that little scope. How can you craft a rule that affects that where they're not worrying about, you know, the third cousin of somebody from, you know, Mobile or something? I don't know. You know so. There's and and. Uh, Kind of did the several point, but specifically the diving deeper point, and that's that's actually exactly how the commission approached it too. They got to and 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 as I mentioned earlier, this commission met monthly, um, and then not just together, but they also had subcommittee meetings, right? They're doing the same. They they kind of gave okay, here's the areas we want to kind of look at. They created subcommittees, and those subcommittees took deeper right thought through this, looked at language, went back and forth, like okay, what about this and. Um, it was definitely not one of those things where, oh, here, maybe this language will work. We'll just write out, oh, yeah, that sounds great. No, it was like looking into it intently because there was always a modification or a change or an extra thought to help kind of refine it. It took a while to do, right? And then those subcommittees, because there were so many different topics, would bring their reports back to the full commission to kind of talk about what they came up with and 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 their recommendations and what their thoughts were and uh, to be kind of considered by the full committee. So, you know, if it sounds like that's how the chairman's looking at this the same way, the same way our conversation will start as an overview and then yes, a definite deep dive into these particular topics. Um, I think is wise. So, um, let's move on to the next slide. In fact, Vaughn, if you keep going for now let's talk about principles. Um, uh, you'll see that, that finally added some color to our slide. You're welcome. It's not just blue and white, right? <clears throat> I was proud of that. I clicked on a few buttons and I was like, well, hey, look at there. Uh, so um, the only restriction applicable to a principle under the ethics laws is the, the pro color. well, you know, <laughs> that was actually a default color. I was just proud to find like an, an insert this little graph here, right? <laughs> I don't think I don't think crimson and white was a palette that was offered by default, but we'll yeah we'll see. Um, so an important thing to note right out of the gate is print the, the definition of principle drew a lot of attention, okay, um, and what to do about it. But it really only applies operatively directly in one particular section, right? And that is now in general things things like no corruption, no corrupt activity, not using your office of personal gain, those things cover anybody, right? So somebody who would be a principal is already covered under those sections. So I don't wanna say that's the only place where it matters. It, matters. it just means it doesn't matter who you are. They're already covered under the general sections. But specifically, definitionally, the word, the term principal, um, is only used in the prohibition against the thing of value, right? That, that's, where, that's where this thing came in, but, that's what also opens up potentially, depending on whether you take a narrow view of the definition of principle that we're going to do or a broad view could open it up to expanding the potential application, right? Or at least making people unsure about what steps to take uh, given it. And what kind of, that's the next point, right? Is that the term principle is defined as a person or business which employs, hires, or otherwise retains a lobbyist. Okay, so the person part not didn't take a lot of, time and attention, right? We get, you know, that individual person, human being, right? But it was the business, right? Is it the business or is it what about the board that acts on behalf of the business, right? What, what, you know, what about the employees? What, like exactly where does that distinction drawn was what took, uh, took up a good portion of the conversation. So I wanted to put this in here, this next point, the purpose, because I thought it was good and helpful for, uh, for folks to remember when reading this report, the purpose of including principles within the ethics restrictions is to protect against actual or perceived undue influence or corruption by those who are seeking to gain individualized benefits from the government, local, state, municipal, um, via hiding behind a paid lobbyist for specific requests while trying to garner, garner general influence or favor from government actors through substantial gifts or benefits. 
that's kind of I tried I tried really hard not to editorialize, but that is kind of me summarizing some of those sentences and phrases that are in this section. Okay, so so the point is there's there's a fundamental the commission considered legitimate purpose for having the principles in there, right? If you have a lobbyist that asks for something specific, are you trying to garner influence by saying, oh, I didn't ask for anything specific because my, my lobbyist does that, but you're still trying to garner influence or at least creating circumstances that would diminish uh, the integrity of government potentially by having folks see what would they consider to be perceived undue influence, right? So there's, those are the two different angles to look at. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So some notable uh, concerns and notable issues that were identified in the report, and you'll see this phrase like I put in highlights because I'm just trying to reiterate like, hey, this is me. There's more in there, right? This is just me taking some things that uh, that we should uh, thought would be worthy of this presentation here at the beginning. So ambiguous language, it could either be narrow or broad in scope depending on context. Too narrow of a definition could allow bad actors to hide behind a corporate shield, while too broad of a definition could result in traps for unwary citizens without accomplishing any significant reduction in perceived or actual corruption. Uh, significant risk in deterring highly qualified individuals from public service and or infringing on constitutional rights of free, free speech. So those were some of the um, <clears throat> kind of things that were that were discussed. And like I said, there's a lot of conversation. This is just boiling it down to the to the general overview. I only have one uh, particular recommendation because a lot of it was just statutory proposed language they they put on paper, and that was to update the statutory language to provide more clarity and strike a balance between achieving the um, principal definitions uh, and its relation to the gift ban, its intended purpose, and avoid unnecessary overreach. That was kind of the that was kind of the goal there. Oh, actually, I did. I, th for this one, I put it in here. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so here's uh, not the exact words, but the highlights of the two different versions that were that were kind of proposed. Uh, I'm sorry yet again about all the words, but I'm going to try to read over this. So the version one, not not in any particular order, just version one that we had uh, was to the points were to take exist the existing definition and add individuals. So we're, again, let's go back to the person versus a business. And really this applies more of the business than hires. So what do we mean by that? Take the existing definition and add individuals primarily within this business, right? Or, or maybe it's an independent, maybe it's a third party business, maybe it's a consultant. Like there's all these different kinds of entities, but kind of more of the business frame of reference, right? Um, so take add individuals who possess significant authority to direct or command the activities of a lobbyist, either on the individual's own behalf or on behalf of a business with which the person is associated. And the uh, significant authority, direct or command the activities of a lobbyist, like what exactly does that mean? That's kind of fleshed out a little bit more in some of the uh, the actual statute statutory drafts that you can look at in the report. Uh, but that, that took up a lot of time and attention. So the uh, next point of the version one was to expressly <laughs> exempt an individual or business that is merely a member of an association that hires a lobbyist. So if you're, you're you know, especially if it's a small business, small company, you're just part of a group, uh, an association that the association hires a lobbyist, but you don't, and you don't have any of that significant control or ability to direct or command the activities of the lobbyist, then that was kind of a, 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 a a clarification that that should not apply to you, it won't apply to you, make it easier to know. Um, and then thirdly, clarify that uh, that an employee of a business does not become a principal merely by lending subject matter expertise to the lobbyist. So if you just are talking, hey, here's the issues that matter, this is why this matters to our company, that's one thing, right? But uh, not merely doing that is not the same thing as being able to actually direct or control the activities of a lobbyist or exercise substantial authority over that lobbyist. So that was a, another distinction that was made. All right, now so now we have version two. Um, and at this point, I've learned to change the color in the back of these PowerPoint slides if I need to, right? So I mixed it up a little bit. Um, so version two uh, highlighted taking the existing definition and replacing the word business completely with an entity just to cover everything that's not a human individual. To add individuals, right, same kind of thing, right, that are uh, directing the activities of a lobbyist uh, on behalf of the principal, um, kind of focused on being able to control the positions that were taken by the lobbyist and the manner by which they were carried out. Uh, version two would exempt members or employees of a principal who are just, just participating in the process of determining what the policy positions of the principal are. Um, similar to the version one, right, but kind of a different angle on it. Um, and then lastly down there, uh, clarify that an employee of a principal does not become a, a principal uh, merely by lending subject matter expertise to the principal's lobbyist, which is similar to the 
some points up top. So there was no real preference for one version over another uh, that was at least given by the overall commission. However, the commission did agree that both of these versions were helpful in its opinion, right? And added clarity and refined scope. So that's that on that one. We can, uh, if there's any questions, I'm gonna, if not, I'm gonna move into conflicts of interest. All right, so let's go, to, let's talk about conflicts of interest. Um, it, was, it was actually really helpful for me to read back over this report and, and, and review the legislative findings for the Ethics Act as a whole. Um, and just say what now? Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Like I said, I'm not, now I'm exploring different codes. And in a few slides, you'll actually see a picture. Yeah, I'm, uh, I was graduating, you know, I was, I, was, I, was, I was graduating from class to class, right, by the time this thing got over with. Um, but yeah, I, uh, it was helpful for me to go back and look at the findings and just see how important conflicts of interest determinations and considerations are for uh, the underlying purposes of, uh, of the ethics laws in general, how closely tied they are. So, the, so for that reason alone, there was a lot of attention given to this particular issue. Um, these points below are all taken from our code of ethics and our legislative findings and our code of ethics, okay? So I divided into, the, into basically two different categories. Um, one is the purposes, right? What are the purposes of the conflict of interest restrictions? Independent and impartial decision making. Uh, this is in our, in, our, in our code. It's essential to the proper operation of democratic government that public officials be independent and impartial and that there be public confidence in the integrity of government. Uh, next point, avoidance, uh, another purpose is the avoidance of impaired judgment, right? The attainment or one or more of these ends set forth in the subsection is impaired when there exists a conflict of interest between the private interests of a public official or public employee and the duties of that person. So those are some purposes, right? The goals then are establishing appropriate ethical standards, right? And I, and I, I, I quoted appropriate because that kind of depends on some of these things we're going to get into, and that's more of some balancing of interests here, right? So appropriate ethical standards. The public interest requires that the law protect against such conflicts of interest and establish appropriate ethical standards with respect to the conduct of public officials and public employees in situations where conflicts exist. Um, Director Albritton is really good at mentioning, like, hey, conflicts exist. The reason why we have them in there is because conflicts, ex they inevitably exist. They're going to exist, right? It's how you deal with them, right? That's, that's kind of the big issue. But, um, but the conflicts will exist, right? They always do in any scenario, um, and public service is no exception. Um, so goal number one, establish appropriate ethical standards. Another goal, avoid unnecessary impediments to public service by those best qualified. And here's where you kind of get into some of the balancing of interest here, right? On one hand, you want to set those appropriate standards. On the other hand, you don't want to uh, have too many unnecessary impediments to public services by those best qualified. The 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 language from our uh, ethics laws, the findings, is it is also essential to the proper operation of government that those best qualified be encouraged to serve in government. Accordingly, legal safeguards against conflicts of interest shall be so designed as to not unnecessarily or unreasonably impede the service of those men and women who are elected or appointed to do so. And then that third point there, allow as much independent economic freedom as possible without compromising impartiality in duties of office. Right, that's, my, that's, that's Jimmy's editorializing, trying to smash it down into one sentence, right, one, one heading. But the, uh, the quote is, an essential principle underlying the staffing of our governmental structure is that its public officials and public employees should not be denied the opportunity available to all other citizens to acquire and retain private economic and other interests except where conflicts with the responsibility of public officials and public employees to the public cannot be avoided. And in case some of this stuff is familiar, you will you will see them a lot in the uh, in ethics opinions and informal opinions and formal opinions. Like they 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 do a good job of kind of you know explaining conflicts of interest and and what is this point about? Well, where can it not be avoided? That's when hard lines need to be taken where it can't be avoided. We can dive into that more later. So this is Jimmy's summary. Uh, of it all, protect the integrity of government operations through essential conflict of interest restrictions without creating unnecessary barriers to public service. So if I were to summarize those findings, that would that would be how I kind of summarized it. So that having talked a little bit about um, that, let's kind of go uh, to the next slide. And this is just going to kind of cover where this comes into play, right? We have, we actually, this, although this doesn't 
uh, necessarily apply to our eth code of ethics, right? Our, our laws dealing with the ethics, but our constitution has a provision in there as well that I thought would be worth considering. It's Article 4, Section 82. A member of the legislature has a personal private interest in any measure or bill proposed or pending before the legislature shall disclose the fact to the House of which he is a member and shall not vote thereon. Then you have, um, now it doesn't necessarily define conflict of interest, by the way, it just kind of mentions the conflict of interest and not voting on it, right? So then our ethics laws are put in place to help start to flesh out some of that definition. Okay, so our code, section five is what I brought in because this is the operative pr provision, right, of uh, where it mentions conflict of interest. Subsection A is the section, I just included that there because to show you this is the, op, uh, the section um, prohibiting use of office for personal gain or use of public position for personal gain if you're an employee. Section B, though, discusses the Constitution, right? Unless it's prohibited by the Constitution, then nothing shall pre uh, prevent public officials from introducing bills, resolutions, ordinances, legislative matters, serving on committees, um, or making statements or taking action in the exercise of their duties as a public official. Then you have this last sentence here. A member of the legislative body may not vote for any legislation in which he or she knows or should have known that he or she has a conflict of interest. So that's where... Uh, that's where the specific term conflict of interest is used in that section. There's actually a definition of that section in section F, in addition to a definition in uh, the definition section, right? So let's go to the next slide and we'll kind of highlight that. So here were some of the notable kind of issues. Um, I didn't always want to say concerns because some people had less of a concern, right? But some people just thought it was an issue to kind of be addressed, whether it was a high concern or just a low concern. But there are two similar but distinguishable definitions of conflict of interest um, in our ethics laws, right? One is found in the definition section, 3625.18, uh, and then in that section we just read about use of office of personal gain, 3625.5F. And there's only one actual prohibition uh, expressed in the statute, right, directly, and that's what we just read about voting under a conflict of interest. So what exactly is a conflict of interest in today's world? Uh, this is a, a quote from our uh, from the commission report, right? Recent court cases have revealed that exactly what constitutes a conflict of interest under the complexities of the modern world of economic and business operations is not well served under the current, current language. That, that's just a direct quote from the report. Um, so this was a little bit more of a uh, important need to address, you know, to be addressed in the, in the opinion of the commission uh, as identified in its report. So that last point there, the commission recognized the difficulty in trying to define the appropriate standards for conflicts of interest issues because, quote, so much of the analysis is dependent upon the circumstances. Um, so, uh, so yeah, the big question then becomes like, okay, what should or what should not constitute a conflict of interest and, and how should that be avoided, right? So that's, that's kind of the the takeaway without a lot of answers, but kind of, let's kind of look a little bit more into the, the, the definition just so you can see it. So let's go to the next slide. So right now under this, is, this is in, in the definition section of our, of our ethics laws, right? This is how it's defined. A conflict on the part of a public official or public employee between his or her private interests and the official responsibilities inherent in an office of public trust. A conflict of interest involves any action, inaction, or decision by a public official or public employee in the discharge of his or her official duties, which would materially, materially affect his or her financial interests, including family members or businesses with which they're associated, in a manner different from the manner it affects the other members of the class to which he or she belongs. Um, and then it lists out some things that are, you know, uh, that are not conflicts of interest, like like <coughs> standard ordinary loans. The occasional pecuniary, like awards, presentations for your public service, travel expenditures and campaign contributions, um, those kind of things which you can see more in the report and in this uh, in this PowerPoint. And some of these phrases, well, uh, that you might have heard the phrase before, in a manner different than it affects other members of the class to which he or she belongs, a lot of times that comes into play with... Uh, with this body, right, and recusing or not recusing from particular legislative matters, right? We get that question a lot. Okay, is this, how does this affect, it could affect me, right? You can't pass a tax cut that applies to everybody and not have something that impacts you, but how how big of a class is impacted by this law that you're doing, right? And that kind of takes a little bit more of a deep dive sometimes, especially if you get, if the class gets smaller and smaller and smaller. All right, let's go with the, the let's go to the next slide, which discusses the definition of a conflict of interest that comes from Section 5, which is the pro prohibition against the use of office of personal gain. 
And that says it a little bit differently, right? A conflict of interest exists when a, um, a member of a legislative body, a public official or public employee has a substantial financial interest by reason of, and it gives these, right, these descriptions, right? Ownership, control, um, exercise of power over greater than 5% of the value of any corporation or company or partnership or any other business entity um, of any kind or character, which is uniquely affected by proposed or pending legislation. Um, and that's another phrase you probably heard, uniquely affected, right? So are you uniquely affected? Is it the same class? You know, that, uh, is it a large class that you're that you're being part? Are you uniquely affected as a part of the class that you, that you belong to? Sometimes these things are kind of go together, and um, and I think that uh, the commission has also done a good job, the ethics commission, at at trying to reconcile those different definitions to come up with a standard at least works in general, right? But with uh, with needed follow up a lot of times with depending on specific circumstances. Um, Quick question, Mr. Yeah. Chair. Um, the so these two sections, why are, why are they? Do they cover different things, or why do the, um, why are they both written differently in different places? Where, where does that come in? That's a good question. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's a. I mean, yeah, it, it's a great question. I'm just I'm I'm, I'm being lighthearted with it, right? Uh -huh. So that was that was one of the issues that was discussed with the commission, right? And and uh, with the and, and in the report, right? Okay, so how do you do that? Does that make it does that make difficulty uh, in the in the do recent they cover different sections or different things or are they just kind of both hanging out there so let me just let, let me just say this for the purposes of this conversation right here because that that is that is a deep dive conversation right um the because several things are at play one is there's only one actual prohibition of a conflict of interest and that's in section five and that's where this mm -hmm. definition comes from right here right it's the one that's more closely tied to it you have the more general definition of a conflict of interest in the definition section of the statute but there's no specific tie, like that. There's no specific thing. Turn the term. See, in statutory drafting, terms matter, right? The phrases that you use in terms matter, and so the term conflict of interest, when it's used in Section Five, don't use your office personal gain, does not say, hey, when I when we say conflict of interest, we mean both the general definition and the specific definition. It doesn't say that doesn't necessarily tie those dots. And uh, I believe I have, I'm saying this right. I, one of the things that I I think might be helpful. I know I want to do is review the um, ex parte Hubbard case, right? That came out, which is a, a, that dealt with a lot of these issues. If my memory is right, aired on the side of well, we're going to stick with the definition that's closest of conflict that's closest to the prohibitive provision, right? So they, I think they stuck more with this five F definition than the general definition. But it forced the courts and other folks to kind of figure out what was exactly was intended, right? So. That's one of those areas that's just, it's a great question. That's why I was having fun with you at first, like without actually answering it, right? It's a great question um, that can be dived into in as much detail as y'all want, right? Uh, at any time, so so yeah, that's good. Okay, um, let's go to the next slide unless there's any other questions on that particular one. All right, so now let's kind of look at some um, some recommendations. So point number one, revise and clarify the uh, conflict of interest standards by doing the following. Replace the existing definitions. And I almost underlined, right, the, the word S just to highlight there was, you know, multiple definitions, but it just looked really weird. It looked like I made a typo, so I didn't include it. Um, <clears throat> replace the existing definitions and references with a standalone conflict of interest provision. The standalone conflict of interest provision would establish a violation as a separate and distinct violation of the ethics laws. So it basically, it would actually broaden the express scope of the don't don't act inappropriately under a conflict of interest, you know, prohibition, right? To beyond just arguably taking votes, right? It would it would it would extend to beyond to other legislative activity as well. At least in the not saying that some courts wouldn't imply that, but it would put it expressly in the statute. That was the recommendation making your standalone section. Still prohibit use of office for personal gain and uh, and 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 using your office equipment for personal gain, office labor for personal gain, those kinds of things, right? But take out conflicts of interest and make it its own separate category, basically, an own separate pro prohibition. Um, and then add to that, right? So make it its own separate provision um, and then require full disclosure of any material financial interest um, before any public servant, which is a public official, right, or a public employee, um, could take any action on such matter. So it's a full disclosure requirement is what this is. Um, and, and I've already mentioned point number four here, right, which is maintain separate 
violations for using office of personal gain. So keep that on it, keep those provisions, just make this a standalone provision for conflict of interest. And then correlated to that was revise the definition of a business with which a person is associated. Um, revise that definition. First of all, that's a long phrase, right? A business with which you're associated. That to, one of the recommendations was to change the term to associated business, for instance, just something that's shorter, easier to say. But then also uh, one of the recommendations was to include independent contractors and consultants in there, whatever that looks like, right? Include those folks. Now, we also have some language that's put out in uh, that I'll go over very, very briefly in the next slide. In fact, I won't go over too much at all, but in fact, it's too small to, uh, yeah, go forward if you don't mind one slide. Okay, so you can't see this here, right? Uh, you can see off to the right where one of the recommendations was to include independent contractors and consultants. Off to the left is a version where I'm going to skip over for the sake of time. Uh, I've already, since I've already hit the highlights, right? That's in the PowerPoint. You can see it. Uh, you can see it in the PowerPoint, or you can see it um, in the commission report, right? This language is right out of the report. Um, so, for the sake of time, I'm going to shift to revolving door employment issues. Um, so let's go to the next uh, two slides forward, Vaughn, if we don't mind. Yeah, if we can go to the, I think it's two slides. Yeah. Oh, do you see that now I got pictures in here, right? I'm telling you. Uh, I'm going to have an advanced certificate in this before too long. Um, I think my eyes were glazing over with how many PowerPoint slides I already had in this thing. I was like, okay, I got to spice it up a little bit. All right, so employment issues. Revolving door generally refers to the practice of legislators or employees leaving public service and heading immediately for lobbying positions. An NCSL 2017 report stated that all but nine states limit this practice. And so Alabama is definitely in the vast majority of states that limit this practice by establishing waiting periods before a legislator can register as a lobbyist or engage in lobbying activities. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So here's Alabama's revolving door statutes, right? Basically, what we talk about when we say revolving door is a two-year waiting period. It's not an outright prohibition. It's just you got pause. Pause for two years before you can do these things. Um, it applies to both uh, public officials. It applies to uh, elected officials. It applies to appointed officials. It applies to um, uh, staff, right, employees. So there's three main categories here, right? Former public officials and public employees are barred from acting as a lobbyist before their former agency or legislative body for those two for that two year waiting period. It applies to public officials or employees who make purchases or negotiate contracts with third parties. They're barred from entering into or negotiating contracts with their former agency for two years. And then the other third main category, right, is uh, public sector auditors, investigators, and regulators of private sector entities are barred from working for those private sector entities that they just audited or investigated, right? And I think it's easy to kind of see how, oh, wait a minute, you're gonna offer me a job while investigating you? What does that mean? You know what I mean? Well, is, that, is, there a, is there a need for a protection there from per, at least perceived you know, corruption or undue influence, that kind of thing? So that's where those kind of originate from. Um, and we can go to the next slide. So some of the notable issues, um, Taken away here, so, so the commission basically took no issue with the fundamental purpose or the goal of, of the revolving door uh, prohibitions, right? But instead, it focused its time on like, okay, well, what are these secondary or corollary issues? So uh, some of these are, I've, I've highlighted here, right? Public to public permissibility. So the current language could be used possibly to unnecessarily limit public to public transfers, right? Um, Secondly, rehiring former employees. Did it really, was it really intended to primarily pre to prevent somebody who left an agency and then wants to go, go back and work for that agency from having to wait two years before they do that? Ambiguous or duplicative language. So that just, there was some of that kind of throughout. It was almost kind of like out of an abundance of caution. There was just a lot of copy and paste in some of these things. And so some was unnecessary language that could create some confusion. So one of the recommendations was kind of throughout that to eliminate some of that duplicative or unnecessary. Uh, language, and you can see that in the actual report as well. So then there was also some vague, vague language in section 23. I'm going to read my point here, which is, it, it is not abundantly clear from the express language of the text as to whether an elected official may represent a client in any capacity during their term of office at any level of state or local government. The main one here, which probably comes to mind to a lot of folks, is a lawyer representing a client before the judiciary branch. Does that mean you cannot be a lawyer and exercise you know, uh, your ability to earn your income? 
before any judicial branch while you're in service. Um, there's a big long story behind 23A and its related issues that I don't, don't have time to get in here uh, into today, but at some point we can kind of give you some of the history of where that came from um, and how it's related to what you do while you're in office. And see, and you may notice 23A is actually not in the code section in with the revolving door, which is section 13, but it's related to it because it's what you can do while you're in office versus what you can do when you leave office. And there's an overall distinction for uh, for legislators that um, that kind of so when you're when you're in office, you're not supposed to, you know, the, the idea is not to lobby at all, right? Not to lobby, back as a paid lobbyist. It's the otherwise represent client language. It kind of was throwing folks for a loop, um, but not lobby. The revolving door for, for legislative officials is for the remainder of your term. So if you leave office, you let, if you were elected to a four-year term, you leave office after two years, the two-year waiting period doesn't even start until after your elected term ends, right? So you get three different categories. There's a two-year waiting period after your term ends. There's however long that's left on the term that you got elected to, you got to wait for, right? And then there's the, well, what can you do while you are an active, you know, legislator, that kind of thing. So um, those are kind of some of the three categories of considerations, but let's, let's go to the notable, uh, sorry, let's go to the uh, recommendations section, the next slide. All right, so one of the recommendations was to create a distinction between elected and appointed officials. Do we want the same level of scrutiny applied to appointed officials um, when they leave, the same amount of time? Um, Let's replace broad, otherwise represent clients with something more specific like represent clients, uh, a private sector client, contractor, or employer. Um, more clearly allow for public to public transfers, simplify some duplicative language, allow for rehiring uh, employees from their former agencies. Um, and uh, it's funny how I have a big duplicative language in there twice, a, du a duplicative language to myself. Um, and then second, all right, and then lastly, right, eliminate some confusion in 23A, okay? We and, and eliminate that broad term, otherwise represent a client, distinguish between statewide and local officials, right? To, to make that that we talked about earlier, right? Should there be distinctions between local officials and statewide officials? So that's what I've got for that. The next section is a statement of economic interest section, but for the sake of time, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to skip over that. that that's very easily a kind of a standalone thing. Senator or spearheaded that effort right, for, for statements of economic interest. And it was about kind of modernizing, streamlining, kind of adding adding some more disclosure requirements, basically, is the sum of it, right? Exactly what those are. We can talk about it at a later date if you want to for the sake of time. That's fine. Well, that's it for me then. All right. Um, any questions? I know that's a lot to digest and a lot for us to sit on and, and have to thank Mr. Intrican for putting it right at an hour, which is what I asked him to do so that well, we would not be too long through this. But as you guys can see, the report from this commission that, that came out talked about the, numbers, the, the number of times that vague language is used, that you know, we, we recognize that there are problems in our ethics laws. And unfortunately, our, over a million people, which is around a quarter of our state, fall under these ethics laws that we have to we, we can't just tuck our head in the sand and say, hey, there's a problem. We don't want to address it anymore because we may get bad press or bad publicity from it. We really need to kind of take the bull by the horns and send the message out to people. Hey, there's a problem with our ethics laws. It's time to address it. It's time to to see what we can do to come up with some clarity through this. Um, my intention for these meetings and for where we kind of go from here, just so you guys are aware, I wanted to give this foundation so that way you can see what where the problems are that the people that this commission addressed. Next month, we're going to meet um, and we're going to talk about some of the legislation that's been filed since the 2010 re redrawing of the ethics laws. Some of the good, the bad, the ugly, what happened, what passed, what didn't pass, why didn't it pass, kind of kind of look at look at where we got to this day. You know, we kind of figure out where the problem is. Figure out now. Let's look into where we go next. For what did they? What have they tried in the past? We may look at some stuff and say, "Hey, that's a good idea. Let's bring this back up." And that may be the foundation of what we look at. We may look at something and say, "That's terrible. I see why it failed." Um, but we've got a lot of work to do, and we'll send some of this stuff out. We'll send you guys some of the information out to you, like we sent this one. The PowerPoint that was presented today, we'll send out to you guys, so you can have that as well. Um, I want you guys, and we started this, again, when we started this committee, we told you it's a working committee, we told you it's a discussion committee. 
this has to be, come from all of us, meaning I don't want it to be a dominant chair position led where if I just say something, y'all say yes, and that's what we get out of here. We really have to work for our constituents to say what's really best, what what is the best single instrument that we can come up with to hopefully address some of these issues because it's sorely needed in our state. I, I personally believe that most people don't want to violate the ethics laws. If you have something in black and white that they don't want to violate it, um, it's just the problem is if it, there's so much gray area, they don't know if they're in violation or not. Um, so I think we owe it to the citizens of Alabama to clear up some of that gray area, to address this in a manner that can actually be digested by the million people that it fall under. Um, and so we can we can make sure that we go after people for ethics violations that really are the ones, the, the bad apples that are really trying to commit ethics violations. So that's kind of where I see this going. Next week, next month, we'll talk about legislation that has been filed. And then after that, we'll start addressing and seeing where we want to go with this or where, where do we want to have. I anticipate the next meeting, Madam, September 27th at 11. Is 11 work with you guys? Because I figure you can hop in town and get right back out and get back home where you are. Um, so September 27th is that Wednesday at 11 a.m. We'll do this again. If you If you need to meet by teams, we'll set up teams as well. I just want this, I want this out. I want the public to see it. I want everybody to have the opportunity to be there. So when we come in in session, if we have some legislation, when we come in in session in February, we've worked on it, we've aired it out, we've talked about it. So that way we're not bogged down in February saying, well, what really happened through here? Do y'all have any questions? I do want to thank everybody that came here to show up. I know this some of this stuff is boring, probably not to this crowd because you live it. Um, but thank you guys for showing some dedication and understanding of how it being there is a resource for us. Tom, you've called, you've talked to us. You know, Cynthia, you've talked to us. If we have questions to reach out to, thank you for being that resource for us. Uh, Chief Stewart, thank you for being a resource to us. And and if anything that we can do to work together. It affects everyone, but anything that people are specialized in that have, the more the merrier is my opinion on this. The more input we have, the stronger the bill we have. So with that, uh, Madam Clerk, I'm going to unofficially adjourn us.